Hello and welcome to my easy to understand guide to Pokemon Go, which is a set video game on the GCSE Media Studies Educast exam board for examination in 2020 only. If you are sitting the exam after 2020, the video game set text changes to Fortnite. So this video is relevant for those sitting the exam in 2020 only. Pokemon Go will only ever appear in an industries or audiences question in section B of component one. And I'm going to go through all the different things you might need to know for those kind of questions. Pokemon Go was a mobile phone based game primarily that was available for um, uh, iOS and Android devices. It's an augmented reality game, which means it uses your own camera to take videos from the space around you using GPS tracking. So it can work out where you are on a map um, and then it overlays um, images, graphics, animations onto the videos of your real surroundings. So it was quite a new technology at the time and no games really had been able to do this pre previously. So the use of this technology, this augmented reality and the GPS technology was very new and was very appealing to audiences at the time, particularly those who spend a lot of time on their phones, which includes a lot of young people and families. Pokemon Go is based on a very successful franchise. The Pokemon franchise in general has been going for several decades and has amassed a huge number of follow followers and fans and pre-sold audiences. And so perhaps basing your video game on a very existing franchise, a very successful existing franchise, means that you have this pre-sold audience that guarantees you a certain amount of success. Pokemon had already had several very successful and profitable video games released on consoles like the Nintendo DS, as well as other consoles as well. Um, and so releasing another video game was seen as quite low risk. They knew that a lot of their fans enjoyed playing games, um, enjoyed using technology um, and enjoyed the kind of games where you can collect things and take part in these kind of competitions. So it was seen as quite a low risk game that would have had a lot of appeal for audiences at the time. Niantic was the company that produced Pokemon Go and they worked in collaboration with Nintendo to release the game. These are two massive video game franchises that have produced some of the most famous games of all time. Um, and so having these two very large, horizontally, vertically integrated global corporations um, as part of your, um, your product means that you are more likely to be guaranteed success. You're going to have more money, higher budgets, more resources and facilities. Um, so it's a great way of ensuring the success of your product. The game was initially launched in a few very large countries like Australia and America. And the reason that you might launch in very large countries first is you want to drum up some support to gain some anticipation, get word of mouth going. And indeed, that is what happened. People downloaded the game and started to play it in those countries and then spread the word online about how good they thought it was. So that other fans in other countries were desperate to play it. So when it was then released in other countries a few weeks later, um, the downloads happened a lot quicker and people started to play the game a lot faster and so Pokemon Go was one of the most downloaded games of all time. We often want things very cheaply now and in particular mobile phone games we don't want to be spending any money on them let alone you know a few pounds some of these other games cost so with this being free it was very appealing for audiences particularly those people with children. Having said that, there are a lot of potential ways for the company to make money. So obviously there are in-app purchases. In-app purchases uh, enable audiences to spend real money on buying fake money inside the, the world of the game in order to purchase particular items. There's loads of things you can buy in Pokemon Go. You can buy the poke coins to then be able to buy poke balls, uh, incubators, eggs, all sorts of other things. Um, and the appeal and attraction of that is that sometimes paying money on your mobile phone doesn't feel like real money. It's also very easy to do accidentally. If you've got children playing Pokemon Go, I'm sure there were a lot of children who accidentally spent a lot of money on this game. Um, and it also the appeal for audiences is that they feel that if they spend some money, they're going to get an advantage in the game and it's going to make them better or more successful. So a lot of people do actually spend money on in-app purchases. 
Another way in which the makers of the game made money is through sponsored locations. So many companies, whether that is restaurants or bars or gyms or hotels, supermarkets, they paid to become a sponsored location. So they paid money to the game makers and it meant that the game makers would put their location into the game, uh, potentially as somewhere like a poker stop where people could come together, they could maybe get rewards, um, uh, they could battle uh, poker gyms and it meant that a lot of people People would turn up at these locations. So the company was making money, Niantic, Nintendo were making money from it, but also the actual location was then making a lot of money from the players turning up at their location who would inevitably then spend money at that location. One very famous brand that did this was McDonald's and they had hundreds of sponsored locations all over the world um, and it made them a lot of money because people were turning up to play Pokemon but were obviously then buying food and drink at McDonald's as well. To encourage players to spend more money, the game makers also held in-game events. So at Halloween and at Christmas, there would be discounts on where players could get discounts on buying things like poker coins within the game. And they would also give incentives for, um, it, you know, leveling up. Maybe if you spent money, you might be able to level up faster within those time periods. Or they would release special hard to get items in those time periods. So people playing at that particular time might be more likely to spend money. There was a huge range of merchandise available to help to market the Pokemon franchise in general and also to market Pokemon Go as well. You could buy soft toys and bed linen and wallpaper, um, action figures, rucksacks, backpacks, sunglasses. You could buy a whole range of things. And that's obviously going to help uh, Niantic and Nintendo to make money from the game. There were some accessories you could buy as well. So you could buy a Pokemon Go watch, which you could wear on your wrist and were, you didn't have to have your phone open all the time then. And it would buzz to tell you when Pokemon were nearby. So, um, you know, quite expensive accessories. There was also a Pokemon uh, ball, like a Pokeball, which you could use as a controller. Um, and um, so offering these additional accessories that are optional, but that might allow audiences to have what they feel is a more quality experience is a good way of making Making money. Niantic and Nintendo also organised several events that people could buy tickets for in order to promote the game and to encourage more purchases as well. So Pokemon Go Fest is an event that now happens every year. Um, it costs um, audiences money to buy tickets to go to Pokemon Go Fest. They happen all over the world, um, but the idea is that you can meet up with other players of the game, you can talk to other fans, they'll have special competitions and uh, battles that you can take part in. And of of course, they will release rare Pokemon and other um, aspects like that at those events. So people are encouraged to go to them. And then those people at those events are more likely to spend money as well. Pokemon Go did have a trailer, um, but it wasn't a big, fancy, expensive trailer. It just showed a little bit of gameplay footage and what the augmented reality would look like. And normally you think of incredibly successful media products as having massive marketing campaigns. But actually, Niantic did very little to market Pokemon Go. Um, you know, they didn't have a big um, campaign on television. They didn't have loads of posters everywhere. They focused their attention on social media. And even then, they just posted a few posts on Twitter and that was it. Um, so... Um, what you need to think about is a why they did that and b did it was it successful like did it work um now the reasons they didn't do a huge marketing campaign was primarily because they knew they had a huge pre-sold audience and they wanted to focus on word of mouth so they released a few teasers and images on twitter and they posted a few things on there and they relied on the massive fans of pokemon spreading the news of the game to other people and it really did work um you can see that in the statistics of just how popular the game was. The game was really, really popular. Um, in fact, so popular that there were several issues in many countries of huge crowds going out to play the game. And in several of those places, there were riots and, and stampedes where people were rushing through the streets. And you can see some images here of that happening. Uh, it was quite overwhelming, huge numbers, hundreds of thousands of people on the streets playing the game at the same time, particularly if there was a rare Pokemon that had been spotted in a particular location. 
you should be considering why audiences enjoyed playing this game. Um, obviously, you have the gaming aspect. It's entertaining, it's fun, and a lot of young people, in particular children, enjoyed it because it felt cartoony um, and it was quite family friendly as well. You know, a lot of video games now have a lot of violence, which may put off parents from buying the game or downloading the games for their children. But with this game being Pokemon and cartoon based, a lot of parents saw it as quite a safe activity for their children and downloaded it for for them and we're happy to spend some money on it. The game was really easy to play. It was literally just pressing on things, flicking uh, something at a Pokemon, so flicking a Pokeball at a Pokemon. So it was very simple controls. And that appeals to a wide range of audience, particularly those casual gamers, people who perhaps don't have the experience of using complex controllers for consoles, but who find phones much easier to use. It was also really enjoyed because it was so different and it used new technologies that hadn't really been utilised yet. So it felt very modern and contemporary and unusual. People also enjoyed it because of this aspect of being outside. You weren't just stuck at home playing the game. Um, you were getting outside, walking around. A lot of people chose to play it, therefore, for things like fitness reasons. Um, and actually, when the game was first released, the company was expecting the typical players to be young men and found that when it was in the first few weeks of its release, the average person playing it was uh, women in their kind of 30s. Um, and you potentially you have to think about why the, the typical audience in those first few weeks was that age. It could be that it's women in their 30s who are playing it for fitness reasons, you know, wanting to get healthy and are using it as a way of enjoying exercise. Could also be that women in their 30s and 40s are likely to have young children and are therefore maybe downloading it for their children or to play with their families as well. Later on, the target audience changed completely or the typical player changed completely. So um, the women who had been playing it um, tended to stop playing it over time. And we often think of women as being quite casual gamers in general anyway. Um, and what tended to happen was the kind of more committed gamers took over. So young men who would, might fall into the kind of struggler category in Young and Rubicam's uh, audience types. So um, the more typical or expected player um, has now become the typical player over time, but it, it wasn't always that way. Another reason people really enjoyed it is for the social interaction. There were people going out, meeting and talking to complete strangers, meeting up with other Pokemon fans. You could see people in the streets walking around with their phones open and you could see that they were playing the game and it made people feel more connected to other people, encouraged people to start conversations with others. And so a lot of people really enjoyed this social interaction aspect. However, that did cause a few problems. It raised some safety issues. Some people were worried about people talking to complete strangers, particularly if the players were quite young. Having to go out on their own in the streets um, to find the Pokemon again adds that safety uh, issue as well. In fact, there were so many people that were involved in accidents as a result of this game, stepping off of pavements without looking and being hit by cars, wandering into other people's property and ending up um, trespassing and getting criminal records. Um, so, you know, there were people who were being injured as a result of playing the game. So some people felt that it was quite dangerous. In addition, there were some people who were taking advantage of this idea of people wandering around with their mobile phone. So um, there were some criminals who were setting up lures to attract people playing Pokemon Go and then using that as a way to um, see people out with their expensive mobile phones and then mug them for their phones. So um, it did result in a kind of uh, a small spate of crimes related to the game as well. The game was rated a Peggy 3 in the UK, um, which means it's suitable for players aged 3 and above. Um, you should be having a think about whether that certificate or why it was awarded that certificate and then whether that certificate is appropriate and why some people may have felt that it wasn't. So the VSC, who are the company that regulate the video games industry, use the PEGI regulations to, um, to give the game uh, the certificate. And they argued that it was cartoon based, animated, based on a children's franchise. Um, and that's why it was given that age three certificate. But many people felt that, um, you know, a people age three and above generally were probably a bit young to really understand the game and be able to play it safely. People felt that children needed to be more supervised. A lot of children were out playing on their own. Um, and obviously the interaction with strangers could have caused some issues as well. So some people complained that the age certificate might be a bit low. 
Game certificates are quite difficult, though, because it's not on a console. Normally, if you buy a game like for the PlayStation and you have a physical box, it has the age certificate on the box. With Pokemon Go, it had the age certificate on the app when you looked at it in the App Store, but actually it also then had a recommendation that the game was only suitable for people aged nine and above. And then another organisation called Common Sense, um, they uh, did a um, an article online that said that they felt it was really only suitable for those people aged 13 and above. Um, so I think audiences were a bit confused about the certificate and felt like they didn't really know um, who the game was appropriate for and who it wasn't appropriate for. Because of the safety concerns, Niantic and Nintendo actually had to put warnings on the game. So when you logged in, it would tell you it's not safe to drive and play this game at the same time. So that is my easy to understand video about Pokemon Go for GCSE. You should be prepared to know lots of factual information about the game and to be able to answer both short and longer stepped questions about audiences, what they enjoyed, what they liked, um, why they played, um, and also about the industry. So how they marketed the game, uh, why they made it, how much money it made and the companies that are involved. Please check out my other videos. Don't forget to hit subscribe. I have videos for almost every GCC and A-level set text and I'm still working my way through the last few ones, hoping to get them all up online uh, before the end of this academic year and the 2020 exams. Um, so please check them out because hopefully there'll be something there that will be useful for you.